Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on Toolkit for the Modern Statistician, sponsored by NIST, the National Institute of Statistical Science. I'm Annalisa Flores from the University of California, Riverside, and I will be moderating, moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is jointly organized by the NIST Academic Affiliates Committee and NIST Graduate Student Network. The Graduate Student Network has been established to create connections among graduate students from different academic institutions, which are NIST affiliates. Under the network, activities have been organized to help students tackle the challenges of graduate programs and help them with their future careers. We schedule social events, uh, social hours, excuse me, every month for graduate students to meet and discuss various topics. Please check the website to learn more about the network and graduate students from universities that are NIS affiliates can become a member. Today's session is hosted by James Rosenberger and Glenn Johnson. All attendees are view only participants and are encouraged to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask questions during the webinar. There will also be time at the end for questions. Upon completion of this session, you will receive an invitation to evaluate the session. These evaluations are very important to NIST and we thank you in advance for providing your feedback through these surveys. A link to the recording of the session, as well as links to slides that the speaker used will be available on the NIST.org website, usually within a day or so. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Mina Chitinkaya Rundell is a senior lecturer in statistics and data science in the School of Maths at the University of Edinburgh. She is currently on leave from her position as associate professor of practice at the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University, as well as professional educator and data scientist at our studio. She received her PhD in statistics from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a BS in actuarial science from New York University's Stern School of Business. Her work focuses on innovation in statistics, pedagogy, uh, with an emphasis on student-centered learning, computation, reproducible research, and open source education. Welcome, Mina. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. All right, does that look good? Okay, uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we are going to talk about a toolkit for the modern statistician today. And uh, you can find the slides that I'll be running through at this bit.ly link at the bottom of the first slide. And um, I'll put that again at the last slide as well. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, material to cover in a way, so it's going to be a little bit at a high level, but I'd like to leave lots of time for questions and answers where perhaps we can get into more of the detail that you might be interested in. Um, so I'm going to primarily talk about R today um, because it is a statistical programming language. And so that's what makes it a uh, part of the modern toolkit for the statistician. But frankly, it's also because that's where my expertise uh, lives as well. But there are a couple things I want to address uh, before focusing the rest of the talk on R. A question I often get asked is what about Python? Well, I think that the modern statistician, if not, you know, you may not be necessarily uh, at the equal level expert at both, I personally am not. But I think that it would be foolish to think that you should know nothing about Python. I would say that at a minimum, especially if you're at an academic institution, you should be able to answer your students' questions as to how are they different? How are they similar? When should I learn it? Should I learn them at the same time? So I would say that at a minimum is very useful. And also be open to collaborations where you'll be talking using uh, multiple uh, languages as well, even if you may not be the person who is writing code in multiple languages. Languages. Another question that comes up is what about other statistical software? And I'll just say that there may be particular specialized reasons why you might be choosing something like SAS data or SPSS. And there's probably more that I don't necessarily use myself, but we are going to be focusing on a modern approach to doing statistics and, um, and also an open source approach to doing statistics as well. And that's the primary reason for the focus for R here. 
Um, so the first thing that I will talk about is the tidy verse that should be in the toolkit of the modern statistician. So think about doing your data transformation and tidying with the tidy verse. You may have heard about the tidy verse as a whole. Um, a good definition for the tidy verse is an, it's an opinionated collection of R packages designed for doing data science. So when you actually load the tidy verse package, which is a meta package, you actually install a bunch of packages, but also you load along with it, these eight packages for data visualization, wrangling, tidying, reading and writing, and also working with particular types of data in R like factors, strings, or data frames, and also for doing functional programming. So when you install the tidyverse package, there are a few more than these as well. Um, I think one nice thing about this approach of library tidyverses, um, at some point you want to know which functions live in which packages, but as you're getting started, it doesn't really matter all that much because it's all available to you. So what is what makes tidyverse tidy? Um, the all packages share an underlying design philosophy, grammar, and data structures. I think what makes R awesome is that uh, there are you know, thousands of package developers who are contributors to R code, whose uh, knowledge and sharing you can benefit from. But that also means that many, many different styles of coding, many, many ways of accessing functions. So what the tidyverse aims to do is within the tidy universe, uh, there are certain uh, underlying, there's an underlying design philosophy that's shared across packages, which makes it easier to learn the next package when you are familiar with another one. Uh, two big principles is that we have the principle of tidy data, and we also build data pipelines mostly with the pipe operator. So I'll mention those very quickly. What do we mean by tidy data? Um, it's actually probably exactly what you think. It just doesn't happen to be how your data always comes to you. Each variable must have its own column. Each observation must have its own row. Each value must have its own cell. In a way, this seems so obvious that this is how you would uh, organize data in a spreadsheet in a data frame. But as we all know, this is not necessarily how you always get data handed to you as a statistician. Uh, what about the other one, the pipe operator? So let's take a look at this quick task here. Let's say that what I want to say is I want to find my keys, then start my car, then drive to work, then park my car at a time when people are driving to work, I suppose. If we were writing our code in a nested way, we would probably start with this, find my keys. With the keys I find, I start my car. With the car I started, I drive to work. And then once I drive to work, I park that car. When we're reading code like this, we have to start in the middle and expand out. And if you know what you're reading, the, the, you, your eyes are probably trained to do so. But if you're new, sometimes this sort of code can be hard to read because you don't know exactly where to start reading. When you're in a pipeline situation, you start with finding your keys, and then you start your car, and then you drive to work, and then you park that car. So a lot of the tidyverse pipelines look more like this as opposed to that nested workflow. It's not that you can't write code that way. It's that this happens to be um, something that the pipe operator brings that the tidyverse leverages highly. So I'll give a couple examples to you in terms of what I think are um, useful things about the tidyverse that um, might help you as a statistician who is working with data and communicating with data. One of the uh, packages is ggplot2. So this is the data visualization package. And um, the so here's a basic plot where we have two numerical variables and then a categorical variable that we're coloring our points by. The data comes from this package called Palmer Penguin. So it's data on penguin measurements and the three different colors and shapes basically tell us about the different species of um, penguins. What's nice about this plot is that it has visually pleasing defaults. And also when you have specified something like a color and a shape for your plot, you get the legends for free, which is not necessarily true for all graphic systems in R. So not having to fiddle with those uh, legends, but actually getting them for free is really nice. And if you are building these plots, even though the defaults are nice, you very well might decide that that is not a look that you are interested in. You want to customize these further. So you can actually customize a ggplot at, to your heart's desire. And the way you start customizing a ggplot is by layering other layers. So what do we mean by that? 
I might change the size and uh, transparency of my points. I might then add a new a layer where I define different colors. I might add another layer where I change the theme and get rid of that gray background. I might then add another layer and move my legend around so that my plot can take a little bit more uh, space. You can imagine that we could keep going. So the thing here is that we start with visually pleasing defaults, but then we quickly also can move on to uh, by layering um, change these defaults to produce something that might be more to your liking. Um, another uh, common task that comes is, say you get an experimental data that looks something like this. We have data on six patients. Some of them are in a treatment group and some of them are in a control group. And we have taken their blood pressure measurements at three time points. Usually when we have recorded data like this, it tends to come in this wide form where we have the measurements next to each other. But if you're going to be doing any sort of modeling with these data, uh, say, for example, you're going to run a model with something like a random effect for the patient, uh, chances are you're going to want your data to look like this in the long format, where we have an identifier for the measurement, and then we probably want our systolic and diastolic measurements for that blood pressure to be in separate columns as well. Otherwise, that's just a character string. So what, how can we do this with the tidyverse? As we said, we can build these data pipelines. I start with my experiment data and one of the functions that's quite handy for uh, doing this sort of standard data move is a pivot longer. So we're pivoting our data frame longer. We basically tell it any columns that contains the letters BP, I want to pivot those. Uh, create a new variable for me called measurement where those BP measurements are going to go. Uh, remove those prefixes for me so my measurements can just be one, two, and three, and then place the values in a new column called value. So the thing I want to highlight here is that not only does a tidyverse offer a function for doing this very standard data move, but it also has some additional arguments like this names prefix that, you know, knows that generally when we have data recorded like this, we may want to fiddle with those column names before as we're pivoting our data longer. So it provides an affordance for that as well. Now that we have this value column, note that it's a character string and that's not going to be very handy for our modeling. So then we can use another function that separates uh, a variable, the content of a variable into two. And it even guesses if there's a particular uh, sign or a character that is probably being used as a separator. So there we have the slash. Note that in this code, I didn't even have to say that there was a slash there. It's making a guess for me. It has good defaults. If I'm happy with it, I can move on. If I'm not happy with it, I could actually specify what my separating character is. So now I have systolic and diastolic in separate columns. And I have even an argument called convert equals true that I've set to true that has converted that from character to integer. So all of this, as you can see, is really built with the data in mind and with data wrangling tasks that are very common to us in mind. Um, adjacent to tidy mo tidyverse lives tidy models, which uh, provides a bunch of packages for modeling and machine learning. So um, the tidy models, uh, basically, uh, it is a collection of packages for modeling and machine learning using tidyverse principles. So if you enjoy building these data pipelines with the pipe operator, you can basically continue doing modeling with that as well. Um, there are a vast number of packages within tidy models, but a few that I want to highlight if you want to start using these packages would be the first one would be the parsnip, which provides a unified interface to models that can be used to uh, try a range of models without getting bogged down in the syntactical minutia of the underlying packages. If you've used various packages for modeling, you know that the syntax is a bit different for each one. How you do something uh, with MGCV is probably a little bit different than how you do it with LME4, for example. So instead of trying to learn those, you can uh, still learn about the statistics behind those and then use this unified interface for fitting your models. The recipes package provides a tidy interface to data 
pre-processing tools uh, for feature engineering. And those pipelines look just like the data wrangling pipelines that you use in the tidyverse, which is really neat as an extension as you learn. And the R sample package does efficient resampling for things like estimation and modern model evaluation, such as cross-validation. And not only does it do it efficiently, but it uses this paradigm called many models in a single data frame. So instead of running a bunch of models, models and you having to keep track of what you have named them, it actually places all of them in a single data frame and then provides help or functions for saying things like, give me the one with the best set of Piper parameters or give me the one that performed the best. Um, so it basically allows you to keep your workflow in check as well. Um, in addition to these packages that are developed by the Tidyverse and Tidy Models team, there's actually a vast Tidy ecosystem. And I want to mention a few packages here. And these are just some of my favorite packages. There are many, many more out there, but some that I feel like every time on a, I want to do an analysis, um, it's something I use uh, for um, Working with data pipelines for data cleaning, there's a, a package called Janitor that I think is super handy. It will clean up things and has nice defaults for you, like clean up your variable names is something I use a lot from that. And the cable extra package is immensely useful for pretty and complex tables for PDF output. So if your output is a manuscript or something that is PDF and you're already doing your work in an R Markdown environment, that's a great add on to that. Um, and they work with these data pipelines with the pipe operator. Um, packages like Patchwork and GG Highlight work with ggplot2 layer, so we saw that those we separated with a plus. Uh, Patchwork is super handy for laying out multiple plots, so you can do things like subplots really easily. Um, and GG Highlight is fantastic for highlighting particular data points in, uh, in GG plots. It's something I use very heavily in teaching, for example, when I want to highlight look at this particular observation, look at that particular observation. Um, so in coming more towards the workflow end, uh, share and communicate with our markdown. So our markdown uh, is allows you to create computational documents that knit together your text, code, results, and figures into polished outputs that are easy to read and share. Um, if you have used LaTeX, you're kind of in that mindset. If you've ever used Sweeve, um, you're definitely in that mindset. And if you've ever used Sweeve, I might guess that um, it wasn't the easiest thing to learn. At least for me, it was not the easiest thing to learn. Um, there was a lot of syntax to be learned. So what our markdown allows you to do is embed your R code or other uh, you can use other engines as well, but embed your R code um, and um, have your prose and your code in the same document. Um, these documents are um, reproducible by default uh, because you're placing your code and your prose in the same document. And um, once you are in this ecosystem and you feel comfortable with R Markdown, there are many other packages that you might want to have on your radar. Bookdown, for example, for then uh, converting things into books. Uh, Sharingen is a great package for making them into slides. Uh, Blogdown and Distill are great packages for making them into websites. And then articles package that I use pretty heavily uh, to make them into manuscripts. It comes with some uh, style files for LaTeX for particular journals. So if you tend to submit to those journals, that's great because you can simply get started with that and it will take care of both your formatting and things like blinding for you. And that ecosystem is vast as well, but I think these are the primary packages to kind of have on your radar once you are working in an R Markdown environment, the extension into these other packages uh, will depend on your needs, but is also a very kind of smooth learning curve from one to the other. Um, I also want to highlight one thing, uh, which is that perhaps many of you have worked with our Markdown, and I'll guess that many of you may have worked in our studio. A new feature that I'm finding incredibly handy is the new visual editor in our Markdown. So I wanted to show you a little bit of that. So here we're looking at an R Markdown document. One of the uh, annoying things tends to be, uh, for example, adding citations. So while I'm writing a plain text R Markdown document, because I'm 
using the visual editor here, I can actually take advantage of the citation manager. Uh, you can see that I can pull things in from a DOI or from Zotero, or if you have a bib file in your folder or where you're writing your paper, and you can simply insert your um, your um, citations that way. We can also add um, our code obviously here, right? Because we are writing in our markdown document. So I'm just going to bring in the code for the uh, figure that we made earlier. Uh, we're giving our code chunk a name and giving it a caption as well. And I can now refer to that code chunk uh, with that name scatter that we had uh, given it so that I can create a cross reference for it as well. Um, and ultimately what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the code. So even though it is in my document, chances are the manuscript you want to submit, you don't want that in there. So now you end up with a polished PDF document that doesn't show the code, but actually has the code reproducibly embedded in there. And you've been able to create it with something that feels more like a Google Docsy interface as opposed to a plain text plane editor interface. Um, another uh, package that is, I think, handy to have on your radar is Shiny uh, for building interactive documents. So what I'd like to show here is I'm going to um, uh, stop this sharing and do a new share very quickly. Let's go ahead and do that and reload this. So we're going to look at that same ggplot that we created earlier. Um, except this time we're going to look at it in an interactive way. Uh, let's see, hope that this loads. Okay, so I'm looking at the same ggplot and something I can do here is let's say take out one of the species um, and basically let the plot recalculate for me. So how is this happening? Obviously, my goal here is not to teach you shiny code in five minutes, but something I'd like to draw your attention to is that all of this is something you have seen earlier, right? This uh, creating this uh, plot, this code we have looked at earlier. The only new thing I'm doing here is that I am filtering my penguins data based on the user's selection before passing it on to the plot. And I am saying that the input is going to come from the user. So a lot of our code that already feels familiar with one edition of a reactive input that's being passed into it is what allows me to um, basically create uh, this Shiny app. So does it mean that the learning curve for Shiny is super flat? Not necessarily. You still need to learn a few things like how do I build a user interface for my app where somebody can do a selection? And how do I then pass it on to the server side uh, so that I write some code that will use the user selection and make this plot for me? So yes, there is more, the, as you start diving into the shiny world, there is some new syntax that you're going to need to learn. But as you can see, we're still building off of core R code that you would be using even in a static um, environment, and then adding a little bit of reactivity and letting shiny take care of things like, how do I then turn this into a web page? You know, ultimately this is some HTML code here. How that happens is not something you as the R programmer need to worry about. That's what the Shiny package is taking care of. I also in the slides uh, gave you an example of a really extensive Shiny app. This is the California COVID assessment tool. So each of these links uh, points to um, very extensive Shiny apps that are basically uh, being used by you know thousands of thousands of people daily. So going from a very, very simple example to something that's being used at the government level, um, but ultimately the code obviously, you know, has is going to be a lot more vast, but ultimately building on the same uh, principles for building these shiny apps. So let me go back to my slides. And that's the link there. And the last thing I'll touch on is version control and collaboration with Git and GitHub. And um, if you've seen this XKCD comic, um, 
that might tell you something about Git. So Git is a version control system. It was built to do a lot more than doing statistical analysis or data science. It so it turns out that that's a very good um, tool for doing this as well. But in this comic in a nutshell, the idea is that nobody really knows what Git is. Everybody knows a few comments and they you know try them one after another, Git commit, Git pull, Git push. And if nothing else works, you burn it all down and you start over again. Well, the nice thing if you're working in the RCDO environment already uh, is that there is a Git pane built into RCDO that you can leverage. And then you're not memorizing these six commands that other people are memorizing and typing them into your terminal, but actually being able to visually see the difference in any changes that you make, write commit messages, uh, commit them uh, to your version control history, push your work to a web hosting uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit, or if you're working with collaborators, pull their work as well. So um, learning Git is probably a lifetime endeavor, learning it enough to be collaborating uh, with a few uh, collaborators or working on your own simply and taking advantage of version control and the web hosting is probably something that is a lot more doable, especially with the visual interface that is already built into a, a development environment that you might already be using. Uh, GitHub is a web hosting service for projects that are version controlled for Git. So they could just live on your computer or they could live on GitHub servers as well. Um, it is great for collaboration and also for project management. You can assign tasks to people. You can see their changes. You can make sure they're not just overriding your changes, but that when changes come together, they need to inspect them manually and approve them one by one. Um, it's great for discoverability of your own work, and it's also great for publishing as well. So I'll make a comment about that in the next slide. But also importantly, it's where the technical side of the R community lives. It's a great place to look for code samples. One of the things I do is if I'm using a new package and I don't even have a very concrete question that I would post on some place like Stack Overflow, I simply wanna see some people use this code and not the package developer, but real people use this code. I'll simply search for that code on GitHub and see if I'm able to come across any repositories of people using that code and see if I can mimic what they have done um, as I'm learning this new package. Existing package source, source code most likely lives on GitHub. It could be on other uh, uh, web hosting services as well, but a lot of it is on GitHub. So that's a great place to file feature requests for packages that you use or actually contribute to packages as well, whether that's fixing a few typos in documentation or actually implementing a feature for them. Um, so I mentioned that you can basically make publish your stuff. So this is a um, repository that I started maintaining at the beginning of the um, pandemic. And then at some point over the summer, I kind of gave up as this thing kept dragging and dragging. Uh, but I was trying to grab examples of other people doing things co related to COVID, whether that's publications or building shiny apps or dashboards that are built with R and taking note of them for future reference kind of. So here is a very simple repository that has a readme that has a bunch of uh, links in it to other people's work. If you go into the settings for any GitHub repository, you can actually scroll down and find this area called GitHub pages and say, yeah, I want a page for my repository. And voila, it will turn it into a website for you. So if you're working on a project, even just on your own, and you would like to have a public facing side to that, um, that is freely hosted for you, as long as it is a uh, public repository, and you simply don't want to fiddle with making a web page for it, maybe you already have an R markdown document with some narrative and some figures in it, and you want to turn it into a web page, this is a great way of doing that. Um, so to wrap things up, let's talk a little bit about how do I stay current and connected with uh, our community. Well, the first thing is, if you have questions, ask good questions. <laughs> what are good questions? You want to make reproducible examples as you're asking questions. Make them as minimal as you can. If you're asking publicly, so this is not asking a collaborator who's already working on a project with you, but actually asking publicly on something like our studio community or Stack Overflow, 
try to use data in a, 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 a that's available in a package that other people will easily have access to as well, or create the data frame on the fly. And let Reprex, the package Reprex, take care of checking for reproducibility and formatting for you. So I'm going to give you an example of a very common um, issue that people run into. You create a group uh, grouped summary. So let's say that I want to find the mean body mass of these three species of penguins, but I'm getting some NAs and I don't know why. Maybe you already know why, uh, but let's say this is a question you want to pose to somebody. Um, it's very tempting to simply copy and paste the code that you're seeing in line seven through nine someplace and say, why am I getting the NAs? But let's see what happens if that's what you do. If what the Reprex package allows you to do is you can highlight some code and copy it and then say, I want to Reprex it now. And it will show you what would happen if somebody ran it in a fresh environment. And it says, hey, I don't have the packages you need. So then iteratively you say, okay, I need to tell these people to load the packages first as well. Let's see if this is a minimum reproducible example. And the repress package now tells you, I can't find that particular variable with kilogram because you created it, but you never shared it with me. Finally, when you get to a point where you have everything you need as minimally as possible, ideally, to create the same issue that you were having, it actually will give you confirmation that in a fresh R session for somebody else, you'll get the same result that you're getting. It will put it in your clipboard so you can actually post it someplace where you would be asking a question and it'll be nicely formatted. The output will be commented out so somebody else who actually wants to help you can copy your code and run it in their environment and hopefully tell you that you probably forgot to add something like remove the NAs if you have some NA observations when you're finding a main and then they help you solve your problem. So that's asking questions and also staying connected with the community. Believe it or not, Twitter is a great place to do that. Uh, people who develop in R and are users of R and sharing their experiences and their teaching materials tend to be pretty active on Twitter. Um, there is a wonderful newsletter called R Weekly. So if you're not a Twitter person, but you want to kind of be catching up with things that is, gets delivered to your inbox once a week, I would recommend signing up there. They also have a wonderful place to submit any work you want to share with the work world. So if you have a blog post or something you develop that you'd like get, to get highlighted, you can simply submit it there. Um, Tidy Tuesday is a wonderful community effort. Each week on Monday, a new data set gets posted and a bunch of you know, community members will create visualizations mostly or tabular summaries of these uh, data sets. Um, and it's wonderful to take part in to practice things, but it's also really great to just scroll through Twitter with that Tidy Tuesday hashtag and get inspired what other people have done. Um, if you are a member of a, a group that would be considered a gender minority in the R community, um, R Ladies is a wonderfully supportive uh, group. Um, I would recommend checking out rladies.org to see if there is an R Ladies group locally in your area. And nowadays everything is online, so they don't even really have to be local if you if there are um, events they're running that you're interested in. But also R Ladies has a very active community Slack uh, that you can join and ask questions as well. And uh, you know huge number of user groups around the world. So our consortium had a blog post where they um, did a kind of a dashboard where you can find out where all the user groups are. Again, a lot of these are having events virtually, but hopefully soon this will be a great way to um, actually meet local people who are using our whether in academia or in industry as well. And finally, talk to each other about your toolkit. Um, I, I feel like when I was in um, grad school, mostly we didn't talk much about computing because it was something we were meant to figure out on our own. I mean, ourselves, graduate students talk to each other, but I don't remember having lots of conversations with my professors about um, computing, um, at least like what might seem like simple workflows, but things that will take ages for somebody to rediscover for themselves. If you are an educator, also talk to your students, or if you have researchers working with you, PhD students, also talk to them as well about computing, share what you've learned new and what works for you. 
Um, I won't read through all these here, um, but I, I will just note that I've tried to leave um, links to places where you can learn about some of the things that I've been through. And also, if you would like to teach this stuff, the data science box uh, curriculum has lots of materials for teaching some of the things I talked about. And I'll end things there. Here's the short link to the um, slides that might be especially useful for that last slide where I have links to resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mina. Uh, so much information. Uh, so I think that including all the links is really useful. Um, I'm, we have just a few questions that have come through at this point, uh, so I will start addressing those. But if anybody does have questions, if you can please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, uh, that way we can capture all of them and keep them uh, somewhat organized and separated from comments. Um, I guess one of the first questions that came in a little bit early on in your talk was about tidy data. And what does untidy data mean if there's a very specific definition for the tidy data in terms of variables per column, observations per row? Um, and so I'll let you go ahead and address that one. Yeah, so a great example of what would be considered perhaps untidy data is uh, hierarchical data that might come in the format of a JSON file, where instead of having our data laid out as rows and columns, we have them as a nested list, um, which is a very common way of storing data on the web, for example, but it's a useless way of having your data in if you want to visualize it or uh, model it. So it's a great way to store the data and also pull out pieces of uh, uh, of that data, but then ultimately you want to pull out those pieces and unnest that hier hierarchical structure to the point where each row is an observation that you are interested in, and then do your visualization or modeling in it. Um, Another way of thinking about untidy data could be that you have multiple pieces of information in a single column. So I gave, for example, that example of the blood pressure where we had the systolic and diastolic as a character string in one column. Chances are that's not very useful for your analysis that you want them separated into actual numbers that you can do something with. Great, thank you. And, and it seems like you introduced a lot of tools in the tidyverse that would help you sort of tidy that data and wrangle it. Uh, but there, are there any cases where maybe you would not use tidyverse to try to accomplish that task? For that sort of particular task, I'm going to say no, actually, because it, that's not to say that there are not other packages that would um, allow you to do it. Um, but I think that the tidyverse packages are very well suited, suited for that sort of uh, taking data out of a shape, especially something like a nested format, and then bring it to more of a flat file format of rows and columns, the data frame that we um, use. Um, another way of approaching that problem would be something that I can think of is using a variety of apply functions or for loops that would basically do that iteration for you. Um, but one thing that I personally prefer is that I, I'm not very good at writing those apply functions the right way, to be honest. <laughs> so something that it will actually do it for me with defaults. And if I can't, if I don't like the default that I know how to change is a personal preference of mine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, some other questions that have come in uh, is based on your experience. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about knowing Python and knowing R and at least being able to talk about the differences between them. Um, but somebody wants to know if you have a preference towards one of them um, in terms of big data processing, ML algorithms, data wrangling. Um, and if so, why is that your preference uh, in, in terms of which one is better for, for those tasks? Yeah, so I think that that question is hard to answer the better question. I will say that for data wrangling and visualization, I could very confidently say R is what I would pick. Um, for the types of models that I tend to work with, um, R tends to be a great venue for those as well. That being said, I think the conversation around better is often, uh, especially when it perhaps comes to some of these uh, machine learning models, might have to do with 
what your expertise level is. And if you have collaborators, what's a common expertise for you? Um, otherwise, I think um, if there are very particular models that are implemented in one language and not the other, that would be the reason to choose. But I feel like that gap is narrowing because there's a lot of people, and not me, a lot of people who work in this area who are very aware of what's implemented in Python and what's implemented in R and kind of doing this back and forth of making sure that both languages have an interface to fitting those models. Um, but for data wrangling and visualization, I think R is in fact great because a lot of the tidyverse tools are really built to facilitate that. And I've been very impressed with the feature engineering tools in the tidy models ecosystem. It's not something I do as regularly as I use other parts of the tidyverse to be frank, but I think the, the uh, interface is very impressive and really approachable if you've been using tidyverse for a while. Okay, great. And sort of on a related note, somebody would like to know um, if it's important to be proficient in Python if you're proficient in R. Uh, so following up, is Python a necessity to be professionally connected to machine learning research? I don't think so. I don't think it's a necessity. I think what is a necessity is having the patience to read through either a piece of research or maybe some package documentation or library documentation in Python. And then thinking, is this the tool I need? And if I genuinely do not know how to use this tool in Python, do I know, do I know how to go about looking for a similar thing in R? So I think an open mind is a necessity. I think talking to your collaborators about figuring out um, which component of a project you want to attack using which language is a necessity. Um, but I think otherwise for a given individual to be proficient in both might be a necessity for a few particular jobs, but I don't think like globally is a necessity at all. Uh, so another question, we have a few more that are rolling in. So if anybody else does have questions, please uh, feel free to submit them. Um, so somebody would like to know if the GitHub pages are organized by repository, or can you do one linking to several repositories? Um, so the GitHub pages are organized by repository. If you wanted to kind of make a homepage for yourself or for a project, um, then you could create another repo that has a readme that will link to things. Um, the If you are thinking about, is this a good way to create a homepage for myself? Um, I will say that GitHub has a new feature where you can create a repo with your name, like as your name, and then the readme for that will be like your global read me for yourself like it basically creates a personal home page for you if you want uh, without you having to deal with building a web page for yourself so you could link out to things but otherwise um it's per project so per repo okay um another question that's come in is about uh i guess in reference to any of the tools you used and i suppose maybe in terms of uh, our markdown and the and the different packages there is uh, are there any, uh, excuse me, can you use these tools to develop and maintain a CV? So a CV as in like a resume? Uh, I assume a resume. Yeah, yeah. That's my there assumption, is, it's not clarified, but. Yeah, um, whenever I see CV, I don't know if we're talking about cost validation or our resume, that's why I ask. Um, so there is actually, a package called Data Driven CV, um, which is built on kind of our markdown. So maybe I can um, put the name of that just in the chat. Um, and you can basically create a spreadsheet for yourself or something where you have what entries you would want. And then it'll pull things in and make a nice either HTML for a web page or a PDF document for you. So you can maintain it that way as opposed to like fiddling with, um, you know, like a LaTeX document like all the rest of the world does probably. <laughs> I'll have to look that up because I was not aware of that uh, data driven CV. Um, yeah. Excellent. 
Um, and um, finally, the last question that I have um, for, from our panel, or uh, excuse me, from our participants is, um, do any panelists have any book recommendations for somebody who has maybe some years of experience with R, but never formally taken any classes devoted to R? Um, so depends on your background. I think that the if you're interested in learning about kind of doing um, data wrangling and visualization with R, I would strongly recommend the R for data science book. Uh, by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolamond, uh, which is a really nice introduction to um, basically the tidyverse ecosystem. Um, if you are more interested in data visualization itself, there are really nice few, few nice books out there. Um, there's a book by Klaus Wilkie. Uh, you should look up its name. Um, on ggplot too. So it's, it'll be something like fundamentals of data visualization. So if you're particularly interested in ggplot too, I think that's a great book. If you're coming at things more from uh, like not necessarily learning about programming with ggplot too, but more like telling data stories with ggplot too, uh, Kieran Healy, who's a sociologist, but also does a lot of data visualization also has a um, data visualization book that I think is really nice read and like, it gives you lots and lots of detail, but does it in the context of applications. Um, so I think those would be my recommendations for the data wrangling and visualization side of things. Um, if you are more interested in learning about the tidy models ecosystem, there is a developing book called Tidy Models with R. I don't think it's like complete yet, but it is available on the web um, that I've, I found to be a great introduction. Um, you will also see that some of the links I provided on that last slide uh, lead to like get started here type pages for these packages that lead to extensive vignettes. So it's not a book per se, but they are, they look like a lot more than package documentation as well. So they they actually work, work through uh, particular examples in detail that I think those are um, kind of really useful to read through as well. Okay, and then I know those links that you provided, there was one for uh, Shiny. Um, and would that be your best recommendation for resources that are available just to learn that specific package? Yeah, so for Shiny, I have two recommendations. If you are more of a hands-on tutorial type person, that would be the link that I would recommend that's on the, so if you go to the Shiny webpage, there's a get started link there. That's what I link to. If you prefer books, um, as opposed to kind of hands-on tutorial type of thing, um, the Mastering Shiny book would be what I would recommend. Um, that is, I think, like very recently completed and also available online. And um, it starts with the basics, but gives you lots of detail in terms of um, like the background for reactive programming as well. So the first few parts of that book, if you're like, I just want to get something running, and the keep reading if you are actually going to be using it heavily and you start having considerations around how do I write more efficient code so that when users are interacting with the app, uh, things aren't slowing down, for example, or I'm working with big data or using Shiny to present model results that take a little bit of while to run. Okay, excellent. Um... Another question just popped in and says that I know that functional programming is often more important in R, but do you have any recommendations for OOP in R? I personally don't have any recommendations for it in R. Um, so, uh, no, I, I do <laughs> think that what the advanced R book should have some sections on it. Um, if I remember correctly. Um, so that would be the first place that I would look uh, for that. So I'll put the link um, of that as well. Yeah, there is a whole part on object oriented programming there. So that would be a great place to get started. And my guess is that will lead you to other links that would be useful too. 
Thank you. Um, let's see. I, I do have a couple of follow up questions. So you uh, talked about several different resources for R, and I know that's sort of your wheelhouse. Um, but just wondering if you could recommend any Python communities that uh, people can navigate to. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Um, so I know that PyLadies is pretty uh, active as well. So that's one I am familiar with. That's not necessarily for the entire audience, but I think that's a like in terms of a community, um, that's where, what I would say. In terms of uh, learning Python, I'm trying to think if I have great resources that I think would be more useful than somebody Googling, but I feel like I don't, I don't actually really have myself. Um, I think my level of expertise with Python is I can read the code enough to know when I should start Googling it because I'm not understanding it necessarily. So I don't write a whole lot of Python code myself, but I can, you know, put something together, uh, especially if it's on the data wrangling or like kind of basic machine learning end. Um, but otherwise, it's not something I work with um, on a day to day basis. But that's not to say there isn't great resources out there. It's just not something that I know to recommend as confidently. Okay, thank you. Um, another question just popped in. Uh, and with, okay. says when choosing between tidyverse functions and functions like apply, uh, that come in basic R, do you need to think about computational speeds? Uh, so if you have a very big data set, for example, would you choose one over the other? Um, so many of these things are um, as much as possible um, optimized to be better and better and better for um, larger data sets. So I think that if you are, um, if you are, dealing with larger data sets and you're starting to think i wonder if this can be done faster obviously i think first of all you want to familiarize yourself with some benchmarking tools that will allow you to um, actually test your hypotheses on your own data so there are a bunch of packages for doing that in r one of them is called bench but there's you know many others as well so i would recommend familiarizing yourself with that first of all uh, because um, there are certain ways you need to be keeping account of the time, <laughs> um, and some of them have good defaults for keeping account of time in that way. In terms of thinking about should I be, you know, using a particular tidyverse function, should I be using a function that base R gives me, or alternatively another package. So there are some, for example, um, another very popular package is data.table um, that also uh, is uh, immensely useful for lots of um, data wrangling steps. Um, it has a, a slightly different interface uh, than tidyverse, but perhaps um, that might be your wheelhouse. And then there's another package called dtplyr, right? dtplyr that actually provides a tidyverse like interface to the back end of that package. So if there's speed gains there that you want to be able to kind of um, um, benefit from, but want to keep in the tidyverse API, that is also a possibility as well. So this is to say, I don't think there's a one golden answer for all of these. It will depend on how you're working with your data and um, genuinely the size of your data and what you're doing with it. Um, and then I think the other really important thing is if you're working at that size, hopefully you are familiar with benchmarking packages, but if not, that's a great bit of education to do before you dive into comparisons. Okay, so sort of when you start feeling worried about it, it's when you start need, need to start measuring it and paying attention uh, yeah. to, to whether those and data is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then another thing that I find uh, immensely useful is using a tool like a profiler to let tell me um, what are the steps that are taking a long time. So there is, for example, a package called ProfViz that will give you a graphical display of the amount of time certain pieces, certain steps in your code takes. And sometimes you realize, duh, I think I could have written this differently <laughs> and it could be faster. Um, because inevitably, I think that if a new package 
brings you something right that that actually is a worthwhile gain then you should stop everything you're doing and learn about that a little bit so that you can incorporate that into your workflow but sometimes you find out that it's one line that's like bogging things and if you had done it slightly differently um it maybe allows you to google things a little bit better as to how can i do x faster as opposed to how do i work with big data in r is such a vast question right okay Excellent. Um, another question that's come in asks about uh, some general themes that modern statisticians should keep in mind when looking at career growth. Are there particular hard and or soft skills to focus on beyond being able to communicate your analysis well? Uh, should you be aware of any automations coming down? Um, and by automations, it's clarified in terms of skill sets being automated. Um. I don't, I don't know about skill sets being automated, but I, I will try to answer the first part of the uh, question. So, so you mentioned, for example, communicate your analysis well. I, that's obviously a golden thing for statisticians, but it also depends on like how, in which venues you're communicating it um, and how accessible you're making it. So one thing, for example, is that not every journal that you submit your work to will necessarily require a reproducibility check for your work, right? But I think it's immensely useful if you are able to make your work as publicly available as possible, not just the final manuscript that comes out of it, but actually your code um, that allowed you to do, it, whether it's applied work or theoretical work, there probably is some simulation component to it that would be useful to make available. So thinking about um, reproducibility from the beginning as opposed to retrofitting it before a journal submission, I think is super important. And that's something that really uh, becomes second nature to somebody if you are kind of living and breathing tools that allow for reproducibility. So if you're, you know, if everything is in our markdown document for you, sure, sometimes you end up growing out of that single document and need a better project management, but ultimately you're scripting everything, you're labeling everything properly you're writing down your workflows the order in which you're running your code as well as possible um, i think that that's a really useful thing to have that creates a public profile for you that can be attached to any sort of journal publications you have uh, where people can actually learn from what you've done as opposed to get guess what you've done so i think that's a really useful investment for one to make and one that's going to feel incredibly time consuming if you're just doing it at the end, as opposed to you're doing it as your project grows. Um, I think the other thing I would say is um, it's very useful to have, I think, a public profile for yourself. That doesn't mean every single project you're working on has to be public. I think that's like a ridiculous expectation of oneself. Uh, but I think many of us are working on things that we, we very well could make public and sometimes it might feel like a hassle to do so. So choosing um, ways of documenting your work that makes it easy. So I mentioned, for example, if something lives in a GitHub repo, you get a web page out of it, right? So thinking about it that way for especially any projects that you would like to have a public face to, so you're not spending extra time making them public, but it just kind of comes with it, I think is really useful. Um, I also, as an educator myself, I also want to say this is not just about research, but also about your teaching too. And the nice thing with teaching is, rarely is what you're teaching confidential right so we don't like necessarily worry about like private data and stuff when we're teaching that most of the time so it's actually a lot easier to make public um i can't tell you the number of times i've looked at somebody's web page they say they teach a course sounds fantastic and there's not even a single slide deck publicly available for that course for me to see I wonder what they do. So think about making those things public as well. I think that's a good advice. And I think it might sound overwhelming to people who are getting started doing those things. But once you become once once you make it part of your workflow, it'll just become natural and, and doesn't get so overwhelming. And like you mentioned, if you wait till the end, then all of a sudden you're backtracking and trying to catch up. Um, but mm -hmm. if you sort of plan ahead, then that's a, a great opportunity to share your work and um, show what you're doing. So yeah, that's really great. 
Um, I, I think we're just out of time now. So I wanted to uh, thank Mina again for the very informative presentation with lots of links that are available to you um, and thank the audience for attending this session. As a reminder, following this session, you'll receive an email with the link for a brief survey to provide your feedback. We appreciate your comments and suggestions and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Goodbye, everybody.